this is our first meeting of this year. Uh, hope that you all had a good New Year's. I spent mine fighting the flu. Um, so we normally start with introductions, which I'd like to do with. Uh, uh, and so even if you're not regularly part of the group, please give a, a, a reasonably full introduction in your name if you're involved in a company of a particular type of thing so that Troy knows who you are. And uh, if we could maybe start down there next to the wall and just move along and then everybody do a quick introduction. <laughs> Hello, I'm Louise. And um, I'm here out of public interest, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I'm Summer, and I'm the same for you. My name is Caitlin Green, and yeah, I'll be definitely get the cause in here. My name is Jeannie Green, and the same. Hello, I'm Robbie Green. Here to check it out. See what's up. I'm Mike Ramone, I'm here to do the same. I'm John Thompson, and I'm here out of professional interest as I'm in the process of bringing uh, or creating the local affiliate to the workshop network of companies which are located in California and Washington at this time uh, and are expanding in terms of analytic services, product development services, and uh, process and process development. Jay, why don't we start with you? Hello. I'm, <laughs> I'm Diane Densmore of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Network. I do hospice and that's why I'm here. I'm Jay Moore with uh, Spotkin. We do uh, physics-based uh, educational and just fun games. Contraption makers are current. Me? I'm Carrie Black. I am at Oregon Research Institute. I show up occasionally when I can to these, and I thank you for having them. Um, but today I'm mostly here just, just out of interest. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Barry Height, and I'm shooting for the Oregon Agricultural and Food Rural Consortium of Medford Breaks Church. I'm Marlene Mastery, mostly with the City Club these days. Catch back here and then continue. Byron Clayton, Oregon Research Institute. My name is Richard Farmer. I'm also at the Oregon Research Institute. I'm Jeff Tanell. I'm with Spock. I'm Amy McDermott with Studio McDermott Production Group. My name is Ian Swing with Vidal Reed. Uh, some of my clients are interested in the industry. I'm Neil Vance. I'm with Sepsis. Uh, Janelle Erickson, registered nurse and interested in. What's going on? And a son making miraculous recovery with Henry Waldvogel. Uh, I'm here to network with people who are interested in uh, PDS, which is a botanical drug source. We're talking about the whole plant extract and uh, safe sanitary <coughs> medical ways of doing it. So if anybody has any interest in the conversation, uh, I'm setting up a pilot plant with the uh, uh, food grade solvent extraction process. Do you folks want to introduce yourselves? Oh, I'm Mike. I'm with Studio McDermott. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm Shula Jaron. Um, I'm the executive director of Freddy Lab. And we are a nonprofit organization that supports early stage entrepreneurship in Lane County. and. Um, Troy was one of our earliest members, so I'm here to support Troy. And also to support Paul, because he's a very interesting hobby. I'm Barry's mother, and um, we've been doing this all over in North Dakota at many different places where <clears throat> he's talking about of his the, the tape that he's telling me. And um, this is, we, he didn't, I, I think, expect he was going to be doing something that seems to be very upsetting to a lot of people. 
Only in North Dakota. I, I, I say, he's my in, son. In, in, in yeah, Eugene, it's, he's all it's, he'll upset me. He's been into photography for three years. That's all he's ever done. I, what, I can't say anything. He wasn't trying to do anything. Do anything. He's just proud of what and wants to build people to go more into this filming. And thank you. Sorry. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Gretzian. I am a uh, business development sales professional. Uh, I am one of a few principals of a management holding company that is developing several different products and brands. Uh, one of our subsidiaries, uh, a beverage company, we have Canatonic, which is a line of uh, lemonade-based beverages. We're in over 30 dispensaries in the state already. Uh, in 10 days, we're releasing a coffee carbonated coffee flavored line. Uh, we have a third beverage coming out. We have several other products in the works or we're acquiring uh, with the intent to have a family of products kind of like Johnson & Johnson family of products. If I have a rep going into a dispensary, I'm going to have them bringing in 20 different things instead of just one item. Adam Went, uh, Iris Educational Media, Cascade Production Rentals. I'm also the unit secretary for the NAACP. I'm here to support Shula. Power to that is exposed. It takes a village. Good afternoon. I'm Grace Whittacombe, and I'm here to glean whatever I can today because I'm here with my son who has an entrepreneur spirit. And um, so we're hoping to get on board with something here. That's pretty much my introduction. Uh, I'm Jacob Anderson, and I'm an entrepreneur aspiring. I'm Eric, uh, MBA student. I come to these things because they're incredibly interesting. I'm Derek Costi. I'm at Oregon Research Institute, and I'm basically interested in um, the potential consequences and benefits of recreational uh, medical medicinal cannabis. So, Troy Morris. I'm the you should direct any tomatoes or popcorn at throughout this whole process, but we're going to be talking about maybe some, some social and general science policy implications of um, around uh, a research project that we've been developing since October of 2009 to quantify and optimize the application of marijuana. And I've asked some of my friends and fellow scientists that we basically observe our day to day and are helping out in, in our applications also just tolerate our ancestral talk of marijuana um, to have a, a, a lively discussion around marijuana as adults and maybe a little less teaching child and a little more forward motion and, and explore some areas that would be most beneficial to Oregon if we start the adult conversation right here in Eugene. I've been to a lot of talks, watched them, they are all short of a mark that I think marijuana deserves because there's no denying that it's here. And we should just all be adults about it and figure out how we're best going to interact with it. My name is Lisa Sakamano. I have a PhD in biochemistry. Um, I'm currently involved in creating a new company called IPRX for helping entrepreneurs commercialize their IP, all certain aspects of their business development. I was asked by Troy just a couple days ago <laughs> to be on, the, on this panel, so I hope I I'm Dawn Adele. I'm the Clinical Director of Operations for MX Biotech. And I'm Dawn Nouveau, and I'm here with MX Biotech. I'm Patty White, and I'm a public interest and to support MX Biotech. My name is Nina Adams. I'm here out of uh, partially public interest. I'm also a medical marijuana and cancer patient. I coordinate information amongst other patients and, and clinics and people that I know and stuff. I'm also here in support for the next biotech. Darby Giannani with Pacific Benefit Planners Insurance and I'm also the chair for the Chamber's Economic Development Council and I dabble with everyone who's doing fun and interesting stuff so it's I'm here often out of interest. 
Paul Berger. I used to introduce myself as a dabbler, but now I've got a real job. And I'm the founder of SAFSIS. And SAFSIS <coughs> is a company that publishes evidence-based and research-based behavioral health and education products that are developed for the most part under uh, grant funding. So I, I founded this group with the idea of uh, reaching out to the many research groups that we have in town uh, to get them uh, more focused on commercializing or in some way disseminating programs that are developed with federal funding that never see the light of day. Uh, so currently our company uh, publishes all Parenting Now's parenting curricula and uh, parenting materials and we're working with the ORI people on a number of projects which uh, gave rise to my asking Troy to be here because one of the products I recently wrote a commercialization plan for for a uh, million and a half dollar uh, grant proposal uh, involved um, a tobacco prevention program for grade five. So as part of my market research, I was speaking to people who are prevention, abuse prevention people, uh, mitigation people, California, Colorado, etc. And the conversation in, in made four calls and the conversation somehow always got to, yes, we are very interested in tobacco prevention, we're very interested in alcohol prevention for the schools, we need these things, when are you going to do something on marijuana? <laughs> So the, uh, the need is there, and so this group really represents the people who are doing research, and uh, there's two sides of that. They have to get funding to do the research more and more, and I think it's sort of a good thing. They have to prove that, that when they do that research, it's going to actually get out into the real world and not just be another thing that gets published and put on the shelf and everybody forgets about it the day that the grant runs out. So. So that's what I'm all about. So real quickly for our group, uh, I want to let people know I've gotten very busy, uh, which, so I want to keep this group going, but my, my, major, my major efforts are in getting topics. Now we have a topic that will either be February or March, and it's a good one. It's, it's Kenya Lubert, who, used, who has been here and done several presentations. She's now working with uh, Lane County Mental Health. She has a pretty in-depth uh, presentation on ACEs, so those of you who are involved in early childhood education will know uh, it's the Adverse Child Ex Childhood Experience Study, it's a couple of docs from uh, <coughs> Kaiser Permanente who did this a few years ago and it's become sort of a movement. So these are people who are working very much to uh, connect the research on what happens to people who do not have proper parenting, proper support in early years. And so that's that's an important topic and those of you who are on my email list will, will be alerted when we get a date and we do that. But I could certainly use not so much help getting the, the word out, uh, knocking out emails and writing descriptions is not a problem, but I need more t presenters and topics of things that people want to hear about. So if you have a presentation, or if, if you really want to get involved with this group and, and uh, you know, help me run it, that would be great. Uh, it's not going to go away, but we may not always hit the mark on a monthly meeting if, if it's, I just don't have the time to chase people as much as I used to. So that having been said, I know everybody's here for Troy. Uh, so I'll make a real quick introduction. He has uh, degrees in organic chemistry, chemical engineering, and psychology. He's the marijuana guy, sometimes very hard to get hold of, <laughs> but uh, he's doing serious work in the area, uh, and there's a lot of research that's going to need to be done in this area, both on the uh, physical and chemical side, uh, drug development, that type of thing, but also on the behavior side. And there's some great opportunities, so uh, you want to, are you part of the panel? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to sit near Troy, and, and, and actually, rather than you do another introduction, I'll just let you, Troy, uh, introduce your panel members, and uh, you've got till 5 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes we're, we're always dealing with the day-to-day uh, the -day realities, and so this is Robin. She is a parent of a patient that has come from far across the United States to evaluate marijuana as a possible therapeutic for her daughter who is, deals with intractable 
uh, at the Etsy, and I'll give you, let you uh, give a quick summary of kind of all the things that you guys have tried. Um, oh, as far as my medicine, okay. Um, as I said, I'm Robin. Um, I have a 17-year-old daughter who, for 14 years, had, has had epilepsy. Um, she's had been on she's been on every single um, medication you can think of. She's been none of them have ever given her seizure control. Um, she's had a vagal nerve simulator put in, uh, which is like a pacemaker for your brain called the BNS. She's also had two brain surgeries. Her last brain surgery three years ago left her without the ability to walk for 10 months. She was in a wheelchair. She um, had to relearn everything all over again. Uh, she, to this day, still walks with a brace at times if it's long distances through airports and use the parks and stuff like that, has to use a wheelchair. She was five years of school at very key moments in her life. And uh, she is 17, but more like a 13 or 14 year old. So that's been our struggle so far. It's a very great family, which represents um, you know, what people are looking for and, and is basically in the midst of a 30 day trial. Yes. Evaluating, so I really want people to understand that there's a process to this. That there's basically always a before, there's a middle, and that investigative period is not a miracle. You know, although we are working and we decided not to turn home. Yes, uh, today is the 36th day. We're actually here in Oregon, and we decided to stay. I left all my belongings, everything. Everything's going so well with my daughter that. I refused to take her back to the life that she had, which was sleeping 18, 20 hours a day or more due to the heavy medication, that, all the medication that she was on. Robin, Robin represents bravery. <laughs> <laughs> Completely starting. I'm late because I went to a job interview, so. <laughs> so. so that's okay. We're honored to absolutely work with her and her daughter and most of our other, other and I just thought Robin well, would be a perfect person to try to help let people know that they're not a victim uh, in some of the issues that they're dealing with because there are solutions possible. At least they should be investigated. This is Lisa. Uh, she mentioned she has a PhD in biochemistry. Lisa is somebody who we were at the Ferdy and, and bless her, she basically listens to every single conversation we have about our patients, our program, and the whole, the whole deal. And so in addition to having that very strong scientific background, I thought she'd be the very good person because she can reflect basically a year's worth of, of business and protocol development uh, at Ferdy, the, the incubator at Fort and, um, and so Lisa's gonna basically lend herself as kind of a, a person of strong science background to some more general issues. Um, Paul had asked us to not give a chemistry lecture, which is the only thing I know how to give. So, so the idea was is that what happens if we were to just pretend like we're not necessarily doing this project but that we do have some insight into cannabis to maybe just start having adult conversations about where it should go because that's probably the most useful to a community and then you know, we can always talk about specialized applications later. But, um, so I'm really stoked that, uh, that Lisa's here. She also did fill in a little bit late because um, we had a, a mom who have a little bit of challenge to be here today. So that's, she didn't know this, but that's why we asked her so And you can get into chemistry actually because uh, if these are mitigations that have to do with behavioral health and those type of things, um, some of the people in the room are brain scientists, so it, was, okay. it, it won't go over their heads. Okay. There are no rocket scientists here. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy, I hope you know. And then Donna Dell, her background is in medical imaging and uh, specialty clinic uh, administration, and so she's come on to be able to help us try to formalize a clinical program because right now, really just been running around as people solving problems and so trying to find some sense of formalization of what we're doing ultimately participating in Ferdy means that we're moving from a thought-based or a research-based focus to a commercial-based focus and so Don's extensive background and actually all of the objective imaging and, and, and uh, documentation that we're looking for in the outcome really lends uh, and to what we're doing and of course also just that you know absolutely everybody. In the, in, the, in the medical field, so that also helps. Uh, that just helps us out, and so um, again, we're going to try to stay focused on some more of these general topics. But I guess we'll dive a little into science anytime. Okay. 
So does anybody have any like burning questions they want us to answer before we get started? Because I just tried to guesstimate. And I have a, a question but a comment for the audience. Um, I did a little bit of digging on, on some of uh, Troy's work uh, and uh, in general use of uh, extractive cannabinoids for specific purposes. And the results are nothing short of miraculous and dramatic. I mean, people who have multiple seizures all day long to go to no seizures for 30 days or, or a week. This is day and night. So there, there's some incredible science here, and Detroit's doing some incredible work. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, here in Oregon where we're growing it for medical and soon for recreational. How do you go about? in the scientific commercial community extracting from the plant. Excellent. So that's very briefly, is, is, is it super uh, critical CO2? Is it a uh, solvent that you're using? And then after you get your, uh, I believe it's called BDS, Botanical Drug Source. Okay. Then how do you go about breaking it down into the constituent Okay. This is very briefly. Okay, this is a great question. I would say that this falls smack dab in the center of the standard protocols for organic synthetic or medicine chemistry. So the very first thing would be is what's your final objective? Two, you'd be looking at the materials that you're trying to dissolve or you're trying to carry. And so you'd be looking at polarity and solvent selection is actually the, the, the term that's left with there. And then you'd be looking for an overall safety at the, at the end. And then as far as separation, you have molecules that are very similar molecular weight, not almost identical, and very similar polarities. And so those are the two primary, uh, with only a small few constituents that have chirality issues. So you end up having a separation challenge, and so it depends on what you're doing. Um, but I would like to get into some more detail because the question that you're asking for me to accurately answer takes a few other pieces. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, we'll stay, I'll stay as late as anybody wants and we'll talk about that. If, you don't have to answer this now, but during uh, your presentation, if you have uh, specific, so I'm still kind of not sure what MX Technologies is or does, and it sounds like maybe it's because it's in, in the process, but um, <clears throat> epilepsy, a little more on the physical side, if there are applications where you've done work with uh, things like anxiety disorder disorders, um, PTSD, those types of issues, if you could include that in some of your examples. So, can, let's do this. It's because those are very specific to me, then um, can we do those at the end? Yeah. And, and is that cool? Just because we actually have a treasure trove of information here, and you're asking me very a very specific question that actually I would probably only be able to answer. Uh, well, actually, maybe actually, actually, maybe I'll answer, but the point being is that we'll just stay kind of focused on this, and we'll just stay out after, if that's all right. Okay. Um, in order to be able to get through this, what I wanted to do is simply do this. Just take all of the information that you've ever seen or learned about marijuana from Facebook and throw that away. Okay, can everybody just like all the reposts and all of the, all the things that are out there. Um, Google Scholar was trying to make it, but it got totally busted by Facebook ads. Um, so the very first thing I think is, is that the entire premise or the basis for marijuana is wrong. And it comes from trying to turn it into a functional substance. I think that the, the basis for marijuana is that it's treated as a commodity. It's sold by a pound or it's sold by an ounce or a gram or some weight measure of weight or anything like that. But marijuana has got a lot of things going for it, which really lends itself more to a technology. And um, so the very first thing I would like to establish is that this conversation is about marijuana as a technology. And, and I wanted to just use a metaphor because I use a, a bunch of them. And that is, is that... The way we value technology is not that we don't weigh it. So we don't we don't weigh the internet to determine, which is a tech, clearly a technology, we don't weigh the internet to determine its value. We measure its impact. And if we if we treat marijuana as a technology, then we open up some amazing opportunities for Oregon, which is kind of the home of marijuana. And you can't ship it or you shouldn't ship it and don't ship it out of state lines but you can utilize that intellectual property or those discoveries or that core expertise that Oregon can develop anywhere in the world. And so for Oregon, 
which we're never going to be the Walmart of weed. We're going to rely on the fact that we just need to be smarter and we need to be more innovative. And so if we do that, there's more money waiting for Oregon than there is just trying to sell weed because we'll never compete with the, just the, the mass amount coming out of California. So I'm really, really, really pushing a lot of our bureaucrats and a lot of our policy people to look at marijuana as something other than a consumable because it's worth more. It's more true. It's more accurate. It's, it's more beneficial. So we're going to talk about marijuana as if it's a technology, a scalable technology, something that's more beneficial than how much it weighs. So is everybody cool with basically starting with that premise? It's also the title of what we're doing, which is Marijuana Spy Technology. Um, so the very first thing I want to basically want to start to discuss and is to ask a very simple question is that there's a lot of people fired up about marijuana, but it doesn't seem to work, right? Everybody's still at odds. Think about thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we're having the conversation about marijuana today like this. Like this is the definition of ridiculous, but right? I mean, realistically, the plant is what it is. It always has been, but it seems like it's a giant train wreck. All the policies seem to not work. Every time somebody tries to do X, it doesn't do that. Nothing seems to work. Law enforcement doesn't understand it. Advocacy doesn't understand it. So my first question I'd like to tackle is basically to ask the simple question, what is wrong with cannabis? Why is it so broken? Because that begins our problem identification. And according to the Lean Canvas, that is where we want to start with trying to identify how we can solve the problem is to understand what's wrong with it. Does anybody have any? Government. Me. Okay, the government. First of all. There's some history you know, where uh, <coughs> between the cotton industry and the hemp industry and, and ways to put the clamp down on, on hemp and, and big money involved 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, history has set the stage for Here's how we treat this and, and make this as this, this bad brand. Power. Power, okay. Definitely power. Like what do you mean about power? Um, uh, shamanism. Uh, the, the power of an individual who knows how to formulate it, uh, dose it to people. Uh, an example would be uh, Peru and, and uh, Brazil, Alaska. Uh, shamans make ayahuasca uh, very similar to the way uh, uh, pre-industrial revolution, I'm talking about pre-petroleum uh, solvent and, dist and distillates, uh, the, the way a shaman would extract the uh, constituents out of the plant. Yeah. That's power. Yeah. Knowledge is power. <coughs> I, I, I assert that there's nothing wrong with cannabis. Indeed. Right. I mean, I would. Right. I mean, is it really isn't that lethal? If it is lethal at all, right? It doesn't interact with the ability to kill us for the most part. It's an estimated LB50, and it doesn't really change our brain sensitivity to addiction, the cessation of our brain chemistry, right? So, I guess the the, the biggest part about this is that <clears throat> maybe it's the way that we're doing cannabis is the problem, right? The, the opportunity that ultimately arises is to look and not necessarily try to legalize illicit market activity under the guise of legalizing marijuana, because that's really where we're heading. It's just, I mean, we've been involved with marijuana today. It's pretty much exactly the way we did marijuana 20 years ago in college rooms and backpacks. And so maybe it's the method that ultimately is preventing us from being able to realize what it is, because one of the things that our research has shown, a little bit our investigation has shown, is that marijuana's expectations are really low. <coughs> I mean, like everybody's just like, hey, it's safer than alcohol. So are ping pong balls. But why are we killing people over a ping pong ball? They go into ping pong balls, right? It, 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 there's, there's, there's something to it, but I think that ultimately the beginnings of what we start out with is if it could be beneficial and it's not got a significant downside, why are we not investigating the upside? And so I guess for a, for a panel or a group like this that's really looking at what possibilities and where we should go, one of the things is we should look at what can it do. And then the question is, why don't we know? It's only been 70,000 years, 
right? I mean, we've had a few, the ability to get some pieces, you know, some, some tractions on our feet. So Eugene is an epicenter of marijuana. I mean, you'll find out now that you're moving here. But <laughs> is, that, is that nobody does marijuana probably better than this region. And the fact is, is that Oregon is looking at Colorado and looking at Washington because they've gone first. Right. Right. So Oregon was doing marijuana before marijuana was cool, I guess. And so it's what established Europe. I think Oregon needs to, and, the, and, our, and our people here need to understand that it's been here in the culture and eventually it's going to be normal. Right? Don't, don't you think we've kind of been brainwashed over the years, though? The fact that it's a Schedule One drug of no medical value. That's crazy. I mean, we've all kind of been led down this road to believe this is the way it is, and we kind of follow in line. And I think at some point, there have been people that have stood up and said, this isn't correct, and we have to change this. And I think that's kind of the direction that we're headed in now. But, you know, the whole, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Nancy Reagan, drugs are bad, this is your brain on drugs, that left a real lasting imprint in a lot of people's minds. And it's hard to shake that when your government tells you that the Schedule One drug is, is you know, of no medical value to us. Yeah. And so but I think that that's what Troy's research is pointing to, is that, they're, that he's developing that, that groundwork, laying that foundation to say, well, there, there is some value. And if you can lay that groundwork, change expectations, change, you know, change it from a commodity into something that, you know, has value, then you can, but, but you need that framework. You need that, you need that proof. But how do you change the minds of people all over the world that have been? Well, and that's bigger. That's the bigger, yeah. but you need the foundation first. But you I think that's, in my it. mind, why marijuana is bad, because we've grown up believing it's bad. Yeah. I totally agree with you guys. I think the one other part is, is that for every person, for every advocacy group that talks about marijuana being useful for the patients, and then puts 500 pounds together of it, adds some white drugs, adds a few guns, puts that in a box, and ships that to Florida. When I've worked with law enforcement, not worked with them, but you know, our conversations with them, that's what they see. A never, a never ending shipment, where it's almost like really marijuana is a perfect tortoise shell for whatever else they're basically. If you need to get back in the game, you can go down somewhere and basically ask for some weed as a front. And when you start talking to the people who are running dispensaries and are helping to shape the policy, their dispensaries are running those same games. And the fact is, is that I don't know if we basically sit in front of, it, 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 we, sit, we demand more from it, but I think we should just get real because marijuana isn't a bad thing. We're just doing stupid stuff with it. And that keeps the guy with the gun, his hand ready to come through the door because they can't put it down. Because why? I explain this to people who are evaluating our program all the time. Marijuana from Oregon is like a Ferrari, right? It's really nice. And there's not a lot of it, but it's clearly in production. You run across 300 pounds in Texas or Florida of premium weed, it only came from one place in the world, Oregon. You don't have to have any special tracking systems. Of course, the networks talk quite a bit, so they can walk right back up it. But that keeps them here, it keeps them engaged. As a community, if there's nothing wrong with marijuana, then maybe there's something wrong with what we're doing. And all we've got to do is just demand more. Demand more of the people in the industry to say, look, we're just tired of this being an issue. Right? We're just we're just tired of that. So it seems to me we're talking about two different industries. <clears throat> yeah. Recreational industry and let's say we're not though. Let's well, put, yeah. put, put it in the same same bowl because because it's the same problem, right? If you if you've got two two neighbors that are basically causing challenges and you've only got a fence between them, it's the same. And it will be a it will be a generic a gen general solution. Because sending it out of state is not there. I guess what we need to understand is just to say and understand that marijuana isn't the problem. It's it's the process that we put in place. Well, well, that's that, that, that being the point of the schedule one. So you know the reason though uh, that, that researchers are not researching it is because they can't get grant. They're not going to be able to get grants to do it. Or if they are able to get grants. They're going to threaten any kind of federal resources. So we're so we're the at least from the, the research end, it seems the opportunity is is that it's not yet there. I mean, if there's if the federal problem is there, they're not they're not enforcing it aggressively with Oregon and Colorado, and, and we get the four states, we get the ten states, and it's, it becomes like anything else that things change. But 
I'm interested in hearing about the kind of research that's being done on the physical level for diseases, situations like epilepsy, etc., the, the Sanjay Gupta stuff, and you know, all of that. And also getting everybody geared up, because I don't think you can write a lot of grants right now, depending on what you're going to do with marijuana, that could get funded. But it's it's coming. And and, and, and so what, NPR, what can we do to, 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 to get to There's an NPR that? article out there where they basically brought a Dr. Abram, I think, and the head of the NIDA that was based, uh, head of, and I don't remember her name just because she's not as famous in the general sense, on NPR. You can all go back and find it. And she wrote in, in or he wrote, I think it was, and I was just going to come up, kind of try to remember, it was two years ago, eight grants. She funded all of them. He only took one or two. Then went on NPR and explained that they're denying grants. Right. And what she said is, I approved all of them. You're the one who didn't take them. So what I would say is that a lot of the preconceived notions about what where money is for marijuana and what is there is, is maybe not true. I've dealt with some of the toughest customers on this subject in the world, and they're, they're I had a conversation with one fellow. I'm going to remove his name, but tell you what he said. He would be the person that most anybody in marijuana should be probably the most afraid of. His words were, I cannot tell you, you're in the fusion zone, I cannot tell you how thankful I am that you're doing this. For I cannot tell you how thankful, do you understand? I was like, right, you cannot tell me how thankful you are that we're doing this work. So I think the, the other aspect is just to get out there and do it. So just start filing the grants, because I don't think the opposition is there that everybody thinks it is. So, you know, on the, on the concept of the, com the commodity of marijuana, both from the, from the medical standpoint, which has been around for a while in Oregon, and now the future being that it's uh, recreational in nature, and the idea that dispensaries currently are working on the policy and helping to 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 move forward different policies to kind of take the stigma away from from it. It seems to me that it's the work in the research of it and the understanding of it from the medical standpoint, and the understanding of it from the recreational standpoint, the drug interaction standpoint, that is going to help that, and that the dispensaries and the the culture that has been created around it from the from um, the ground up because of the legal nature of it for many years has caused a lot of those um, uh, difficulties in how it's branded. Like if you open the middle section of the Eugene Weekly, it's like, am I looking at medical marijuana here or am I looking at a candy shop? You know, to name things, pink pineapple, you know, blah, 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 does not necessarily uh, elicit a change in opinion in the minds of people who have been uh, inundated with federal drug policy since they went to elementary school and Nancy Reagan said just say no. So it's it's it goes. Be, it, I think it's the work in researching the the drug, but also rebranding the way we think of it in our minds. Not necessarily. Uh, I don't think the dispensaries are really doing anybody a favor by naming things what they name them. When in fact they really need to be looking at, you know, the differences between various strains and communicating that clearly to, uh, you know, when I look at a beer and I look at the IPV, I don't even know, I'm not a big I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know you know, I don't know. But when, yeah, okay. So you know, are the wine drinkers out there? It's like there's certain things that you can say, oh, this has got a certain this and it's got a certain that, but they're not. It, there's obviously terminology that needs to change in the way we think about things. And I think it's the, the work that, that happens in researching the, the biomedical properties of the technology that are going to help to to maybe frame that idea more so that when it does come into the marketplace, there isn't this um, stigma. Yeah, stigma. It's like walking into a pharmacy and just seeing no labels. You know, yeah. the dispensary, like what you're talking about. It's like there's really no explanation there There's what nothing. you're going to get. Who knows what you do? Do your best to pick it out and... Yeah. And... Um, can you describe the biochemical research you're doing? Yeah, yeah. There's one... Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of comments. I think in terms of languaging, which I think is extremely important, I've been up and down the West Coast and across the country involved in this business uh, as it's been a gray market the last number of years. And I think just a just a quick one 
recreational to me is a terrible word for what we're doing in this ship. It should be adult use because as one person, I can't remember who it is, says it, it, there is no use of this product that is not at some level medicinal or preventative. I mean, and when we understand that and allow adults to choose when they use it for either a safe inebriant or the proper kind of dietary sort of supplemental tonic, our medical system does not have room for tonics at this point, like traditionals do. So what we're experiencing now is like, as we recognize all this push from the black market with the silly names and the branding that goes on in the black market and the kind of business operations that happen there and the ethic that happens there is extremely dangerous as it moves forward. So we have the problem between legitimate people who understand business technology trying to bring it up appropriately and yet this push even in the dispensaries, as you're saying, with the sort of candy-coated part of it. And so there's a, there's a problem there. And it is separate, I think, from the problem of getting the medical research in the proper place. If anybody in the rooms knows of Rick Doblin's and what MAPS has been doing over the last year, they took a case all the way to the Supreme Court with a doctor at MIT. The reason was not because there isn't grant money available for the research, it's the fact that NIDA and the DEA own and control the only legitimate substance, you know, uh, resource, the farm in Mississippi, for stuff to be gotten and given for accepted, granted research. Just recently, I believe it's been in the last six months, they did win a ruling that now NIDA is going to allow and put out license for, this for two or three other operations <coughs> that are going to be able to operate a little bit differently than the group in Mississippi. And don't be fooled, over the last 15 years, the U.S. government, through that farm and various agencies like the DHS, has been taking out patents on both the processing and separation of this technology and the combination of various cannabinols for different diseases, including one I'd seen recently where they're now, they have a patent on attaching the cannabinoids to uh, um, nucleic acids and so forth and amino acids so that they're going to be able to come up with forms that are much more bioavailable and targeted in certain ways. So they know the writing's on the wall and I think we're going to see some of these problems and there's the two, the industry growing up and coming from the illicit garage to professionalism which is a big challenge and then this idea of how do we then bring it in and allow researchers the right type of materials for the right types of protocols to get this figured out. Yeah, I think that the, um, the kind of research that is happening in the medical angle of things has to be supplemented by research to separate what is government propaganda about it and to address legitimate, in some cases, social concerns that people have about the legalization. Until you address that, you're not going to really get it to be a mainstream thing as long as people think that their kids are going to start smoking it when they're 12 years old. And so that line of research can be funded right now. Right. That And it is being funded. But way more kids abuse prescription drugs and we don't do anything. I'm not arguing with I that. Mean, I just I'm just saying you've got yeah, to separate the logic what's behind and what's it not. Is, yeah. is pretty hypocritical when you... One yeah. like, you talk with the legislature just to segment into our second question here, which is how many people here would support marijuana or cannabis research as a policy in Oregon? Right, this is a trick question, by the way. <laughs> the belief is that you wouldn't. The belief is that there's more support, 54 or whatever, percent for sales. And what I don't think they fully understand is that we, we ran a, a, over time, we ran about a, 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 a big poll, and I think we're at like 99.67, and the, and then the ones that were no are like, you know, you're Obama. You know, so, so I'm sorry. Whose belief is that? You said the belief is our, that our, our policy, our policy, our policy leadership on that is basically controlling marijuana. So, so we've had conversations on a federal level, on a state, state level. level. Okay. Right. And so, we've had conversations. I've had conversations with them that hopefully are noted that they, where they think that research is going to get in the way of sales. And we basically corrected and said, you know, actually, we sell tobacco, and we that we research that more than anything else, and that research says don't use it. And we sell tobacco like it's going out of style, so it's not going to inhibit, um, you know, the truth and truth and advertising. So, 
I think that one of the first things that we need to do when you figure out how to do this is to basically support research in Oregon from marijuana. Right? What so, research do you see needed? I mean, is it the social change? Is it what? Are, what are you? What? There's so much. There's so much missing. I think it's all research. Think about there. Are, there are there are you know there are tens of thousands of medical research papers on marijuana, cannabinoids, the active ingredients. Nobody knows about it. In fact, you would you a lot of times people are told there's no research. There's piles of information out there. But the fact is, is it's not very applicable. Or they were communications, or yada yada. It would be very simple for Oregon to just simply say we're going to do this. And in this process of commercialization of marijuana, to simply set aside grants to study this, because I guarantee you there's probably maybe only one or three of us in this entire room that actually know what marijuana potency is, despite us everybody thinking that it's related to THC. Okay? So the fact is is that even percent alcohol when it comes to marijuana is an unknown. I mean, that, you know, there's people, anyway, the point being is, is that there's a lot we don't know, but we are in a hurry to sell it. What they don't understand is, is that, that there's an enormous amount of interest in researching marijuana at all levels, right? So we just talking about the, <clears throat> the personal use or of marijuana as a, as a, a I don't know what the proper term would be, intoxicant, or are we also talking about, and I don't know if this is the case with the, 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 the law, but that it opens up the opportunity to utilize hemp in general in, in a, and grow it in a more in a legal fashion in order to use it for the materials that are, I mean, is that part of the equation too, or is that something that's... Coming right, coming here, but just oh, sure. Okay, back, back, and then, then back to you. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention: you mentioned tens of thousands of medical research papers. I think uh, good, solid sociological research too. You know, uh, one of the people in here mentioned something about the fears that twelve-year-olds will start. And well, you know, I started when I was thirteen, uh, and I'm here, and I have a master's degree, and uh, uh, you know, from a fine university. I think that uh, sociological research of, that I would hope would find would debunk many of the fears that people have around it and, and find its proper place or a good place for it in our society rather than this place where you're behind bars because you had a joint at the beach when you are 13. Well, because that doesn't exist in Oregon, I think we just take it to the next step. I mean, the fact is, is I was walking through downtown Eugene last night to go meet somebody or something. I don't do weed, so that's just my bad memory. Basically, and the point being is, is that as I'm walking, this guy's puffing away. I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, ah, smoking a blip, uh, split. And so we don't have that fear, that attackative nature, I think, in Oregon as much as some other places. I think it gives us the ability to step forward into research a little bit faster. I mean, realistically, you can, you, can, you can study it as long as you don't have it. And you can possess it as long as you have an OMP card. And so we've had conversations on whether or not I should have a caregiver card or whether or not I should have a grower card. And the answer is, I don't know, because I may not necessarily be a caregiver for one person. I may be somebody who's researching this this way. And the conversation is, well, we'd rather you see you not go to jail. Okay, great. We have the ability to walk forward into research. We have the ability to start doing this. You're going to have to have policies. You're going to have to, because I mean, the problem with marijuana is that nobody can trust the supply chain logistics. Nobody in marijuana can deliver what they say that you're going to get. They can't even deliver that it's going to be the skunky monkey bunch, right? Because that plant is probably, <laughs> probably that's not the plant, and if it is, it's not tomorrow, and the results are not what they're going to say that it's going to be, despite what the person behind the counter says. The fact is, is that the supply chain logistics is the problem with marijuana. So are you saying that, like, basically Oregon is, could be on the forefront of stabilizing the understanding of marijuana as a consumable. The entire world gets their weed from California, and California gets their weed from Oregon. Right? You heard this saying? The fact is, is that the people look to Oregon for, for things marijuana at that upper end. Why not take advantage of it? Why is there not a tech stars sitting in Eugene, Oregon? This Colorado is about the same size, right? Why is there not a tech stars for marijuana research, biotech development? I mean, committed to that. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to open that, and Silicon Valley for marijuana is going to pop up the very next day. That is the point of this meeting. That's right. It should be us. It's right. So I know it shouldn't be, it should be us. 
we should take it. Like we should just take it. We should just basically say marijuana research is Oregon. And and like you said, it becomes it becomes about the information, about the information about marijuana. It's not about it as a commodity, it's about the information that we're that we and then that becomes the resource. That becomes the, you know, the value. Right. There's a at least three facets to the, the conversation about the hemp plant. Um, there is a whole bunch of industrial hemp uses and other countries. We're importing as a nation over a half a billion dollars of finished hemp products from Canada, China, and other countries because we can't allow our farmers to grow industrial hemp. There's the George Washington Carver came up with 300 uses for the peanut. I am a firm believer that there is just the plant itself is incredible as, as far as what what can be discovered through research. But peanuts don't get you high. I'm not going to be straight up. Um, and and there is there is there is there is a history of marijuana as an intoxicant, and that has overshadowed so much of what's kind of behind the scenes. What you know, it's like the tip of the iceberg. But you know, and addiction, the aspect of addiction makes certain medications exceptionally effective, and it really so that we're talking about management of a of a, of a substance. And that can be done because we manage things that are far worse, despite the Schedule One status, and that are that are marijuana. You know what to do. Well, well, let me, so let me finish. You mentioned so, earlier, I know we're in well, the Chamber point. of Commerce, and so you know, Oregon is uh, marijuana research is Oregon. Let's make that our brand. Uh, but let's not forget there are good people in Holland who've been working on this for a long time, and there are other people in the world out there that are our allies. And, and you know, if we're smart business people, we're going to network with them on the industrial hemp side and on the medicinal side and on the recreational side you know, in all these areas because it's it's a multifaceted plant the british empire did not they required it to be grown on every landowner's property in the british empire where it could be grown that was the law if your that. place we gotta, we gotta keep it back. Right. Right. so let me finish um there is so much value again like what we see is the tip of the iceberg but it's so visible it's, it's, it's the, the tail wagging the dog um, there's tons of medical research needed. I, I'm a firm believer in and we should be as a state we're just so poised to be exactly ground zero for all kind of marijuana tech um, but it, there is this this stigma, this this you know that we have to deal with, we have to live with, and have to get around. And there's no way you're gonna you know it's an attack. But kind of a parallel. There are people have said that the early growth of the internet was really financed by a lot of adult use. Um, I'm I would be happy to pay a specific tax. For every product, whether through dispensaries or recreationally, that goes to research. And we could literally, almost overnight, have a multi million dollar fund for folks like you and, and to put Oregon on a map and, and jobs, and, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. And I think we can actually get there through private means as well. There's so much interest. You've got this boom, there's all these investors who want to come in and invest in. In these things, but they actually can't engage in marijuana because all of the laws that apply to protecting investments don't apply to marijuana at this point. But there are solutions that you can use to basically move that forward. So, so if I may, okay, okay, we're dancing, we're dancing around, and I'm going to uh, elucidate upon the obvious. Follow the money. If you can't OD from from marijuana, then why doesn't ever, and and we had it totally legal, anybody could use it. Make your own product, whether you're doing an infusion or an extraction, if you, and the only thing you, uh, wrong about the extraction is the idiots that use flammables inappropriately. 
But if everybody could own the plant, use the plant, it's not illegal, then look and see who suffers. So the first from step the, lack of is, the first step is that Senator Chris Edwards, who's from Eugene, has introduced Senate Bill 479 and 480. Those are both research bills, both step establishing some support for this. I think people should call him and say thank you because he's kind of out there by himself. So, so in building an economic development strategy, we have a concept that's been around now for 30 years <coughs> of the Willamette Research Quarter. OSU has a school of pharmacology. I, I, later on, at some point, I'm interested in, in the exact, how, how you prescribe something and how you actually have double-blind studies. I, I, mm -hmm. I suspect not, but, but we have, on, on the medical side, we have a school of pharmacy at OSU. And we have this huge behavioral health complex here between U of O, ORI, OSLC, all the other folks. So we've got tons of social science behavioral health down here. That's a... Uh, a recipe for getting this stuff done and the my understanding is that we are in that early stage where we could be doing some advocacy with the people who are going to be doing the taxing when they tax for, for marijuana part of that money is going to be going for mitigation education etc well this is the time to get that, that research money specified and to create that concept of we have these, I mean, the, the concept always comes to what's at OSU and what's at, at the U of O. That's what kind of drives all of these things. And if by, by including both universities, you get all of that political power of those two universities. We also have a board in health sciences. And we have a huge clutch cans of research places. You're going to have to go Representative Hicks, went to the governor, as I understand, only because we prepared the presentation for him, to convert the, the IFI drug corridor into a, a corridor of research. I and I believe I can probably say this or speak to this, but I believe that there is a very open ear in the in the in the administrative group that is trying to figure out the legalization of marijuana. I have had conversations with people who are at the highest level there, and their support of this subject, at least one of their support of this subject, was I pretty much had to apologize for my preconceived notion that the administrative groups around this I figured they just didn't care. So there's definitely people within the, the, the emerging administration around marijuana that are absolutely committed to this subject. I mean, amazingly so. So I think that, the, that what we all have to do is just declare it and, and start giving them things that sound something different than what is going right now, which is, you can just imagine all of this stuff that's just noise. But the fact is, is there's a research bill, there's two research bills, and there is a receptive here in the administrative aspects of marijuana, they may be all by themselves because the majority, I think, believe that there is not support like this. Who sponsored the these two research bills? Senator Chris Edwards. And he dropped them. I mean, you can speak about it now because it's, it was in the Oregonian. So. But it's 479 and 480. And they're one to um, four, 480 establishes an agency for clinical research of cannabis and basically like a wine board of experts for cannabis, which they just ask us, well, if you do it, we say, you do that. And then 479 creates a task force on clinical research for cannabis and directs cannabis profile versus illness programs to be established. So we just kind of use what we're doing as a pilot for where we should go. Now, what your request here was is that, okay, so you're doing all of this one-to-one -one research. How does that affect the community at large? So instead of, at the end, we can focus more back towards the core, but the fact is is that I think that the scientific community holds the key for investment. Because you can do laboratory as a service, you can do clinical research as a service, you can do data as a service, you can do, all of these things are investable, these models are investable. And when you look at how successful tech stars and some of these Y Combinator groups do, because they're putting their thoughts out there, you use the universities as feeders, but it has to be entrepreneurs that are driving this. That's the way that it's successful. And so there's, this is a lot bigger discussion. Hopefully, someday we can have it. But so I think it's, everybody is in favor of, of, of research. Is there anybody who's against it? Then I just ask everybody to just make one phone call. Chris Edwards, tell them we were just at a meeting. Troy was forcing you to do it, and you're making the phone call. But just tell them we're on board. Where do we need to be where? Who does he represent? Uh, I guess the Whitaker, Whitaker. Torres Church. 
Yeah, he's he's and he's and he's a great guy. He's a business guy, yeah. and so he, and he's he's passionately <coughs> supportive of this, and he's especially passively based on the outcome aspects about researching cannabis based on what it can do as a technology. I mean, he's really really been awesome. I just have a brief question. Um, uh, how much communication is going on between the for-profit pharmaceutical industry and what you guys are looking to do at the uh, kind of entrepreneurship level? Um, aren't they a huge value if you can get them on their side and get it investable in their terms since they are kind of the primary apparatus as far as medical? Yeah, I would, this is my personal opinion. So I am O, right? I would say that basically the pharmaceutical approach right now is very aligned with the black market, the illicit market, which is we've got one strain or one version and we're trying to basically force it down everything. And I think their success shows that that's what that's what we're doing. Um, we obviously cannot make claims about our, our program because we just cannot. But the fact is they're doing it wrong. Everything about marijuana is being done kind of wrong. By the pharmaceuticals. By the way that the, the, the lack, we have not, we have not actually unleashed the potential of the plant we just let it do what it does, and what you can move forward very quickly. So let's again, we'll get into the details of that later. Um, let's talk about addiction. Do we want to talk about addiction? Yeah. Okay. I would assert that ultimately marijuana acts the opposite of most medications. So it's it's a low modulator. It doesn't. It's not persistent the way it works, <clears throat> which which means it kind of works the opposite of the drugs that cause addiction, that cause chemical addiction. Just in a general sense of it's the opposite. It's the, it's the black in the world of white, or it's the white in the world of black. But that our addiction specialists treat it the same as a white drug addiction. And in fact, it's the opposite of that. And so, what maybe might be of extremely important place to look is maybe one of the reasons why. Marijuana rehabilitation is an absolute joke. Is a good way for courts to get five thousand dollars per person trying to get an expungement, but the fact is, is that people are not necessarily treating for what it actually is. And I'd like to open the idea that we start looking into treating it for what it is, because it might be closer to a call for help and an indicator of a mental health issue to be addressed. Um, Interesting you bring up this addiction issue because uh, I go on for a while about that. But I just uh, ran into my wife just shot me a, a cartoon by a man from uh, uh, Stuart McMillan uh, from Can Canterbury, Australia. Uh, it's about some addiction exper experiments, and it's called the uh, I think the Rat Farm or the Rat Ranch, and it's. It's, it's worth your time, and he does some uh, incredible work that looks at you know these paradigms that we have about addiction and what they you know what we've been taught and what the actuality might actually be you know across all drugs and, and behaviors. And so, I mean, I think it's important for marijuana because, yeah. Anyhow, it's a horrible replacement for most drugs because it doesn't interact with the body like most drugs. So. I think one of the solutions that we should investigate is just to step back and say, well, how does it work? Because it's been documented, and again, we'll get into more of the science and stuff, but, but you had an awesome way of explaining this the other day. I want to steal your thunder, but... That's okay. <clears throat> I have someone that has an, a, you know, an addictive you know, issue going on in their life, and their family member came to me and was like, you know, this is really upsetting, this person's doing this, they're doing that. Well, my the way to kind of you know help them wrap their mind around it, I was like, our family member has a brain tumor, and they are acting out this way because they have a tumor in their brain. And the person looked at me and they were like, really? Do they really? And I was like, yeah, isn't it sad? Don't you feel really bad for them? And they said, yeah, I really do. I had no idea. And I'm like, that tumor is addiction. There's an underlying cause as to why that person is acting out in the way they are. And if we get to the core of that, you know, and treat it like we would a brain tumor, like it's any other medical condition, then maybe we can kind of get a little bit closer to helping people instead of saying, oh, that person's an addict, they're sick, we can't help them. You know, if someone was, had a broken arm and they were getting high, we'd want to take a look and, you know, 
not ask why are you getting high, but we want to say, you know, let's fix your arm and maybe that might help your situation a little bit from a medical, you know, perspective. Can you um, describe a little bit more in a couple of sentences what you mean by marijuana is not the same kind of addiction, doesn't operate the same kind of addiction process as, say, heroin or cocaine or something? What, what do you mean by that? You're changing the sensitivity of brain chemistry. So, yeah, it doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't change your brain chemistry like heroin might change your brain chemistry. Marijuana doesn't have that. No physical dependency. No, no. This would be this would be chemistry. This would be chemistry related. Physical. You can have physical. I mean, we can become addicted to all kinds of things based on thought or you know. We, For sure. But you can you can have people who are self medicating unsuccessfully. You mentioned sorry. I think. Oh, you mentioned PTSD earlier, I think. This is a great segment into that particular thing. So the PTSD epi epidemic in Oregon is not over now that PTSD qualifies. Why? We basically came and said that if we legalize or if we allow PTSD to be a qualifying condition, then marijuana is going to solve that because it, it cures PTSD. It cures cancer. It cures, doesn't really cure anything. But the fact is, is that it does open the opportunity to be able to seek mental health assistance that can address that issue, right? And so if it can't chemically, and, and, and chemical addiction is a powerful medicinal tool. Marijuana is a terrible replacement for those, for those, for those chemistries. I just want to make a distinction that I think is important, although it might be true that brain chemistry isn't affected for individuals who use sensitive, marijuana. Sensitive. Brain chemistry is affected. But there is a quite a bit of evidence that brain functioning, particularly among long-term heavy users in multiple domains, is affected. Okay, that's that's a different. So let's let's take that as a different. So that the mis the mismanagement of a of a medication is self medication, right? So, for example, what I'm just trying to explain, and I'm not a psychiatrist. I work with a bunch of on a project around PTSD, so I'm just mimicking a bunch of information. Right, but I, I want to just go back to a point that Byron made. You know, as we have a dialogue about marijuana and, and where things are going policy-wise, as well as um, it, through legislation um, and the effects that this is going to have on people's <coughs> lives, we got to we got to tease apart the myths from from the facts, and we've, we've got to be honest in terms of how this does affect people, how it becomes a problem for some people, and how going forward. We can approach these issues responsibly in such a way that people um, the, that the risk of adverse effects of this substance are, are minimized. Harm reduction. Harm reduction, primary prevention, and just knowledge. Having okay. knowledge about if you've got somebody who's unsuccessfully unsuccessfully treating themselves with medication, then then I think it's, as a society or as a, as we as a group of researchers or anybody walking by. We maybe we take the obligation on to be able to say, look, you're unsuccessfully mitigating your issue. You're using marijuana wrong, right? It's not that because you're addicted to marijuana, but you're using it as a crutch, or you're basically self self medicating. That leads to self medication of everything else because they just keep spinning around and around based on what's available to them. Maybe it's on us to understand that it's more of a cry for help, right, than it is a an addiction addiction issue because really what they're doing is unsuccessfully mitigating. A problem. Now, one of the things that we're talking about our patients' families is that what happens if young people subjected to cannabis extracts ultimately permanently changes their biochemistry because they, because the development part of their brain is inhibited in myelination, bimetal formation, their ability to respond, their their endocannabinoid response. These are things that we should be looking at because. If it is a safe medication in, in, in relativeness, right, if we're able, if we're able to find the amount, and what we find when we find the amount, what we find is we're in the sub MCGs of cannabinoid extracts per whatever their dose is. And it's the opposite. So instead of using a gram of extract, which is the equivalent of many, 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 many joints. For a four-year-old, we might find out that one MCG delivered every three hours achieves a mitigation rate of over 85 percent. 
when that profile has been matched to that issue. So what I would say from what we're finding is, is that clearly cannabis is being done wrong. But as adults, who cares because you have the right to do whatever you want. However, it shouldn't preclude the fact that the research shouldn't follow that. Somebody else mentioned, Paul, maybe did it too. The CNN thing with Dr. Yep. I would say that that's the wrong direction. I would say that the facts show that it's the wrong direction, the outcome shows that it's the wrong direction, and everything about what's really going on there is wrong. It's not true. Was that the CNN? Okay. Right. The way that they're basically promoting the, the use of cannabis is incorrect. And if there was a, like, what is it, when you have something that's completely backwards, so find more dimensions and then find whatever the version of backwards that is. So now are you talking about <coughs> that part of the release, talking about the person with the persistent epilepsy and the growing... The saddest part about that is that it seems that cannabinoids, when deployed correctly, or accurately to that particular issue, it can be documentably successful. I thought that's what it was saying, though. That's what I took away from that, was that those that family, the brothers growing it in Colorado were coming up with the low THC and the high CBDs, and, the, and they were helping. And what I really want to hear you say is, how do you dose? How do you know what you're giving your kid? How do you know that what you gave today is going to be what you give them tomorrow? And, and how do you know where you get it? Not really where you're getting this, but who's testing this? Where is this? And I'm not one of the three people who knows potency in this room. How do you know what to give, how to dose your 80-year-old your grandma, you know, with cancer, and then your child with epilepsy? Who can tell me that? Right. That's the research that needs to be able to do. Right. So that's, and that's actually the crux of our, of our, of our project. But I felt that's what I would take away from CNN and the Sante Gupta was that that is happening and that that is useful and that they were doing that. And you're you, saying that, that that was backwards? I would say that the, that the process there is the exact same thing as just going through a dispensary, asking some people for some weed, and then you basically give that to that person. That Wh which I tried and they all said, try it yourself and start low. And I don't want to try it myself. And starting low on this 80-year-old woman is much different than... And, and, I, and so, I, I mean, really, uh, not to make it my personal thing, but I'm just wondering, yeah. where where does that come into this? And, and So this is that supply chain logistics. And so supply chain logistics is the uh, looking at the process that things come to availability and looking at the factors and the control and the demand. And so you end up having models that, in some cases, model pharmacy, and you have models that ultimately model agriculture mm -hmm. and it's the blending of those two models to be able to create a consistent supply chain that can produce the same profiles in and out in and out in and out because a lot of times our patients have to go home and so sometimes they'll come back and we just want to start them exactly where they where they left right because we're, we're continuing the exploration and the fact is is that that is not easy what we're, what we're trying to do is evaluate what the plants are capable of doing. Obviously, we'd like to tear them apart and put them back together in, in, in an engineered sense. I believe that will push us straight into an FDA issue. But we can use the blends, we can use the, the creations that are tied there. What I'm saying is this. Knowing what I know, I would say that one, we should promote research in Oregon. And what I would like you guys to do is, knowing what you guys know, we should pursue research in Oregon. Because I would invite anyone to validate what we're doing, and I would love if, if there was an ecosystem of other researchers out there where we didn't feel quite so alone in this process. <laughs> Am I assuming correctly that basically what you're doing is sort of, and I don't, I, I, no one is more skeptical of evidence based as a term, it's the most thrown around term in the world, but it turns but, but but as you get towards chemistry it's a little bit more real in my mind. So I'm assuming you're so you work one on one with patients who have specific things, you go and do the research and try to figure out some intelligent starting point based upon anecdotal and maybe some effort. Well, this is, is, is that is that is that the way things are, so basically you're you're not doing replicatable no, you're not dealing with five children like like your child, and, and, and there's no control groups, there's none of that kind of stuff happening yet. No, the control group would not be involved in a program like Rob, what Robin's family is dealing with because they're coming here for an outcome, so it would be an observational protocol. The 
aspect of what we're doing is saying a good deal of what's in drug development, that, that, that pipeline, is based around lethality, addiction, delivery issues. So the beautiful thing about cannabis is that it's already, in fact, as a drug chemist, you would study this as a, as a substance, as an example, amongst other natural substances. What I'm saying here is, is that we're looking for outcome that can have as an objective measurement as an MRI or an EEG. And the doctor that is, that is doing that imagery is not tied to our project, nor have they usually ever even heard about our project. But that through some help and some connections, we can get them in and get conclusive imaging done, and then send them back to their research institution, and then deal with the questions that come from them about what exactly happened. As far as being able to make sure that things stay the same, there is a way to be able to go about doing that, one of which would be to tear it apart and then just reformulate it. Right now, there's no need to do that because the consistencies can be, can be achieved if you have a very high bar. So we can do a couple of walkthrough or a high bar, high expectation of, of the sourcing. Let's get into that after this. I will stay till midnight. Okay, so what we've basically been hammering around, I'm actually feeling pretty good about my questions, actually. And that is, what experts are we looking for in cannabis? I mean, honestly, what are the people that we should basically be saying, you, 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 you? Right? Because if you can bring that expertise from outside cannabis, it's not so different than anything else. Right? So I think that what you basically want to do is break down this barrier and start inviting the people that are not pro-cannabis into cannabis. I am not pro-cannabis. Just so everybody knows, I don't use cannabis. Didn't use cannabis. I was actually drywalling a building when a physician asked me about whether or not I'd be a dispensary owner. And my background happens to be in medicinal development. So the fact is, is that I think that the, the, the industry could possibly use is a lot of people who are from outside bringing, bringing their research and bringing their expertise inside because I believe we're making a pretty big impact. Was that the first the school of pharmacy and OSU? They they are, but at the same time, they move really slow. See, we don't have to pretend that marijuana is dangerous. We don't have to pretend that marijuana has major addiction issues. We don't have to make. We don't have to pretend. We actually have a functional substance that you can almost begin an engineer type project on it and start taking big information out of it that can start fine tuning the research for more specialized things. So, so I would take this one. Yeah. Uh, in terms of moving slow, uh, part of it may certainly be due to the legal and sociological issues around campus. Research, as these guys can tell you, is really slow, whether you're dealing with education. Look at how bad we've got problems in the school and how much good stuff is out there and try to get research done on something that's good that has you know, anecdotal it's impossible, and, and so that's taking on a much a higher bar to get that going. You have to start it, you know, so it's much better if, if people in the School of Pharmacy are writing grants and, and, and trying to do this kind of research today. It still will take three years, but it's three years from today rather than three years from three years from today. I would say that the cost of entry of this research is so low that you could be yet. How do you define a and, and quantify qualify an expert? Exactly. So that's a good. That's a great. The type of expert. Right now, it's quantified by how much weed they smoke. Yes. Right. And so let's take that. Let's take that out of the resume, out of the CV. So if you smoke a lot of weed, that is just a bonus for what we're doing because I don't think you pick your surgeon by how many times they've had brain surgery, and you don't pick your internist by how much oxy they slam. So. First of all, maybe those are not quite the qualifiers that we need. Second of all, there is a process that's, that is slow. I come from a world that's the same. All I'm saying is that marijuana itself represents the ability to take a profile. Like when we were approached by a nutraceutical company out of North Oregon, and they want to know how many profiles have we shown that ultimately address depression in a particular mode, and they wanted one of them. They want us to do a 100-person study which is great because we do a 200-person study, so I didn't feel bad about redoing it with them. There's, all you really need is an oversight group that can validate your research. It's there, it's, I mean, we're talking about extracting alfalfa, taking that extract, and then basically start applying it to certain things. 
I would be happy to share everything that we're doing just to show you that it's possible and that it costs 150 bucks a month. Right? I mean, there are places to be able to get deep into this. I'm just saying is we just remove the barriers and start. Yeah, I, I would just say that the, the federal law that makes marijuana illegal on a federal level is not the only law that you have to deal with on a federal level if you're doing research. There are laws associated with human subject protections and informed consent that if you're not complying with those, <laughs> you're going to bring the federal government down on your head. It's, it's not just the fact that it's illegal that you have to think about when you're doing research. So what we want to do is think about that and design with those in mind. That maybe as you, you so there's barriers to everything. So what we do is we, we you start in, we've been extremely transparent with the, with the powers that be, quote unquote, explaining, taking them all the way through our project, from soup to nuts, over and over and over again, because we keep getting invited to things like with policy and then we meet with them. Their reception is not negative. Like the, the people that you think are actually trying to stop this are actually not the people that you think are trying to stop this. They're actually waiting for people to start this. They really would like private industry in there. In fact, another comment from that same meeting was, they felt that the only way to really clean up marijuana is if private money started infiltrating and basically driving the illicit market out, the illegal market out. They're kind of at a stand still. We had a large conversation around kind of a war of religions or a war of belief systems. But you just have to step into it and say, okay, you may not be able to go and do everything that you want, but you're right, we're still at the beginning. We're talking about like the whole iceberg. What we're saying is, well, you can't take on the whole iceberg, no joke. But there's a small part that you can start, and basically that continues forward. And you all and we all know that you can move forward on this. I mean, I'm just we're scientists, damn it. <coughs> start putting effort towards here. And there's small, small, small little studies. All you gotta do is prove that you can do it. Put a small beta pilot to put together. Put together a a a, 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 a form of people who are gonna basically peer review. And then, then and then and then submit, and then just start structuring these pieces. Peer review. What do you mean by that? I'm sorry. What do you mean by peer review? So, so one of the uh, aspects in science is that you, when you're doing research, you want other people of, of equal intellect and backgrounds to to re to look over your research and to you know, criticize it, to evaluate it, to 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 validate that fact that you're actually conducting the experiment that you think you are. And that it's being done in a way that would generate information that's useful, or perhaps even replicate the yeah. experiment. I've been doing it for twenty years, but it's all secret. I didn't start the secrecy after twenty years. I've been doing it for twenty years, but it's all secret. I've been sworn to secrecy. All my clients are all anonymity. They all have it. I've been doing it since this law has passed. I've uh, been doing it with the pharmaceutical for the pharmaceuticals, uh, the pharmacy uh, years ago. I went to them, and they showed me how to use, how to even make a suppository, which that's what, as a hospice worker, that's what I do. But there is standards, and I thought that's what you were, you were about, you were setting some kind of standards for uh, what is used as a suppository, what extraction, just like uh, the the whole dosing thing and the whole dosing thing ha has been taken care of 20 years ago. I have people that are living now and we're uh, set to die. So I think the very best thing you do is to protect their information is to then just summarize it and, and put it out and put it out there for people to evaluate. Because in the worst case scenario it might inspire somebody who has the facilities and the faculties to to, to begin investigating a portion of that, right? But I think what we really want to do is just, well, they may be in this room, right? Well, apparently we've got some neurochemists, people here, we've got some people who are interested in distraction, we've got people who have connections to everybody. There's probably more than a handful of PhDs sitting in the room or MDs or who what knows what's What medication are you using to uh, medicate her daughter? So it's a profile, it's more complicated than a medication. We don't believe that strain name or the name no. of the plant has anything to do with it. Yeah. So ultimately, it is an environmental, genetic, and then process assessment that then produces a final cannabinoid profile, and then that profile is evaluated for efficacy. Are you isolating cannabinoids? 
no. No, that would at this point I don't think you really because again you're dealing with a lot of you're dealing with a lot of regulatory issues and although we would lo love to, to, to go that direction, ultimately I don't think you could really do that and not end up having the FDA is so you're just anecdotal to that right now. Well, we're anecdotal in the fact that we have a end result that is documented in an objective way. So we don't we don't claim or anecdote ourselves. And we try to basically stay away from that. Because I'm not the one who can tell you if we're successful. Only a neurologist in this particular case will be able to tell you whether or not we're successful. And so the next step is to basically get that evaluation done, and then they'll be able to tell us what the level of mitigation was. Um, we had a conversation with a physician from the Mayo Clinic, and we had Representative, uh, Representative Hicks come down, and we just let them tell us, tell her, tell him, what we had done with the patient there. I have lots of doctors that are very much interested in it, but the truth is, is they can't do anything. They can't write a prescription. They can't. Well, there's no prescription. There's no prescription know, there. It's an, it's even, an authorization. So even let's, legalizing the research for me, you know, saying that I can go into the hospitals, and I do go into the hospitals for my hospice patients. Well, uh, in the interest, you know, of sharing. Um, being a pain patient and being a, a certain pain clinic here in town, um, and then you have your urinalysis uh, yearly. Uh, they've, I've come up positive. I'm a card carrying, you know, OMMP person also, but I've come up positive for cannabis twice in the last uh, five years. But they've asked me not to, so now they let me know, you know, this next time will be your piss test. But so they're in this bind because of the FDA and um, you know the government and their prescribing authority. If you are in a complex medical situation, there are clinics in Eugene that if you test positive for marijuana, they will not give you any payment. Yes, Period. exactly. And, and, and so the same that's, with my dialysis patient. I have a patient that has no kidneys left, and he's only 24 years old. Uh, well, but and that's he because has they're to, in this bind where they could lose their. Uh, ability to write prescriptions because of the federal government, but I'm 54 and I'm glad to see that we're changing uh, these laws because, yeah, it's been a long time coming. So we're at 5 o'clock and usually the chamber lets us hang around for 10, 15 minutes, but that doesn't preclude you from naming a place where people yeah, can meet with you afterwards. He'll, 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 he'll he just can't do it here till midnight is the problem. Uh, so in, in wrapping this up, I think, you know, I'm a believer that you don't have a meeting without some action items. It sounds like there's an action item, which is to, to contact Chris Edwards. That there is uh, an intentionality, you know, uh, in order to organize something, you, there's all these steps that need to be taken. You're a hard guy to get a hold of or to communicate with, so maybe you're not the best person to organize something, but it seems like it, it, that this state has this opportunity, and if the right people can start working this and bringing in those interests that we talked about before at the universities, etc., so that it is kind of a not quite, not quite private sector, but certainly economically driven, that things can move forward. So that that I would say is so the same. The, the action item is letting Chris Edwards, who's a politician, know that you're interested in this and that you support this, because then you're on his list. And anytime he does something in this, he's going to let you know. Because that's what politicians do. Also, a resource in the administration. Does anybody know if it would be a bad idea to let them know that that also was supportive? you be supportive of the, administ the cannabis administration that's forming right now? That, would there be any benefit to Is that just letting a question to somebody specifically in the room and okay. the answers? I just, I just think, it, you know, if they're getting a lot, they're getting inundated with a lot of information, but the fact is, is that I think they're looking for evidence-based stories. I think they're interested in where should we go, because they're trying to figure out, if I were going to summarize it, how do you turn this into something good? How do you turn marijuana into something good at a very high level? That's a, that's a huge statement. But, but the fact is is that we're missing a bunch of scientists. We're missing a bunch of scientific research. 
This thing is often done with a multi multidisciplinary center somewhere at one of the universities. Well, that, that you know, if you can get somebody who's who's got that kind of drive and who's a bit of a rainmaker in terms of getting some grant money to drive it, that's that seems like work with physicians involved. In Oregon, there's a, a belief, and I assume that it's true, that there is some level of an edict that states that if, if a physician is part of the um, well, that's that's the alarm that goes off. Yeah, for my work. Um, but the but the, that it, as a as a as an MD or as a DO, their license or their employment status is at risk yeah. to participate in the LMP. They still can participate as a researcher, right? So they still have their head about them, and so that's how we approach them. They won't necessarily lend their medical credentials to it. But that they can participate in the oversight of a, of a program. I just say, look, there's a way to do this. There, and there's a best way to do this without basically turning a bunch of otherwise very good human beings into a bunch of black market researchers. But the point being is, is that I think that the belief at the policy level is that it's novel. I don't think they understand that no matter what your demographic is. That the, almost everybody is for this. Like this is the biggest home run waiting. Yeah, it's, it's, the, the opportunities economically are, are very strong, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to do it. And if we don't figure out how to do it, then University of Colorado will, or somebody else. I mean, it's going to be legal in a lot of states fairly soon. I, I do need to say that again. We're at that five o'clock, so we need. So I want to first of all hope that everybody who attended got something out of it. Because that's why we're here, that we will have another meeting next month, and it will be of interest to people who are, have an interest in research around uh, early childhood education. Uh, the meeting's are always worth coming to if, if you have interest in research issues, because even if the topic is not something you're keen on, you get the chance to meet people who maybe you should know. And with that, uh, uh, Troy is here, and if you want to talk about where you might want to move to, because the building basically closes at about 5.30, they close the doors and stuff. I don't know the, I don't know the, the, the places that are around.